Thank you for being here. Glad you uh, got over your hangover enough to come. Uh, two scriptures uh, that I want you to uh, go to with me. Uh, one is Matthew chapter 1, verse 6. And I'd like for you to uh, look at that with me, and we'll deal with that first. But it's inevitable that we would go to Psalms uh, 51 as well. So uh, have that available uh, to view, and we'll uh, be reading and looking at that as well. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 6. And uh, Psalms chapter uh, 51. Uh, This is, of course, the first day of a new year. And wow, uh, exciting times. And what does God want to do in us and through us this new year and with us? Um, He alone knows, but we are open to it. And thank you for your surrender to it. There are, um, I don't know what you would call them, defining moments in a person's life. Moments that reach out, grab a hold of you, literally shape you, your whole perspective of life, uh, your destiny, your direction that you're going to take is literally shaped by that defining moment. Um, your whole idea of living, um, what's going to happen in your kids, what will happen in your grandkids, all defined by that one single moment. And when I say one moment, I may not be talking about a second. I may, need, may, may not be talking about uh, five minutes. I may be talking about a year or two years. A defining moment can be huge. But there are defining moments. I would like for you to think about the possibility that the defining moment, uh, moments of your life are not really what shape you and give you the direction. But it is your response within that defining moment. So it isn't the circumstances, it isn't the event itself, it isn't what's going on that has forced you into a decision, it is the response and the decision that you make in that moment. So the pressure, the the focus is on the response that you're going to have. And that response, we talk about this all the time of course, the idea of the response Christianity is always a response. God is constantly bringing us to these kind of moments where what we, how we respond will literally shape the entirety of the rest of our lives. And we've been dealing with that, of course, in this genealogy of Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, which presents to us the whole Christmas scene. And we've been dealing specifically with Tamar, the four women that are presented to us, not discounting Mary, but Tamar, and then Rahab, and then Ruth, and now today, Bathsheba. And each in their lives, there was this defining situation, which literally changed the whole direction of their lives. And again, the key to the whole thing in every one of their lives was this whole idea of response. How they, if they would have responded differently, the destiny would have been different. So your response is where the focus is. When you come to Bathsheba, which is found in verse 6, it really becomes interesting to me uh, how it is worded. And I wanted to uh, just kind of walk you through that if you would. In verse 6, you'll note it says, And Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Now, you'll notice her name in my translation is not even mentioned. And I looked up a variety of translations, and there are some translations that put her name in there. But if you go back to the original language, you'll find her name is not mentioned. Uh, We put it in there, if we do put it in there, we put it in there for clarification uh, for those who may not know. And in my translation, when you look at it carefully, you discover that who had been the wife is literally in the italics, which means it's not really there. Again, we put all of that in there for the sake of the English language and for clarity. And this may not mean anything to you, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, in the Greek language, it starts with the word ek, 
E-K, which is often translated from, here it's translated by. So when you look at the translation, my translation, it says, David the king begot Solomon by, that's the word ek. It has to do with out of, coming from something inside, coming out of, change of location. So obviously he's talking about a birth that has taken place, and David was involved in that, and he says it's by her. Now, the word her is literally the word to or ho. It's, it's just, an, it's an article. It's our word the or the. And sometimes it can be translated uh, she or her or him or it or this or that. All of those words can be translated out of that. So you got this ho idea. So you got ek, which is by, and then you got ho, and then you got ho again. So the, the, is there twice. And then you got Uriah, the guy's name, and that's all there is to it. That's the whole statement. And I see that and I say, whoa, Bathsheba isn't even mentioned. In fact, when you go back to the ho, ho, you got by, and then you got the and the. This one is feminine. So they translate it, you can translate it she which obviously refers to Bathsheba, but again, she isn't mentioned, and then Uriah. So it's actually out of she, the Uriah. So you say, well, where's the big emphasis on Bathsheba? Well, there isn't one. And if you get all wrapped up in Bathsheba and say, oh, what is she doing in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, that adulteress, my, my, my... Well, let's talk about David. <laughs> the adulterer and murderer. <laughs> and I want to propose to you that in the passage then, the emphasis is not on Bathsheba. She's not the big deal. She's, she's referred to, which is different, I understand. But what he's highlighting here is not really Bathsheba at all. What he's highlighting here is David. And if you understand David in the Jewish culture, David is the, oh, speak softly. David is the, oh, straighten your shoulders when you say the word. David is the salute as you say it. I mean, David is the big deal. I mean, David is, oh, David is the flag. And to do this to David Interesting. Now, you know the story of Bathsheba because it's been on TV. Uh, it's the time when kings go out to war. Uh, Joab, who is the general of David's army, they've had all the meetings with David. They've counseled. They've been around the oak table. They've spread out the maps. It's time to extend the territory, conquer the enemy. Uh, the strategies have all been laid out. Every, everything's in place. And it's the day that David is going to do as he always does when they go out to war, be on his white steed, uh, all decked out in the proper garment, and he'll lead his men because that's the kind of guy he is. But this year, he came to Joab and said, you know, arthritis is acting up in my hip. Ground seems to be harder than it used to be. Not as young. Uh, hey, you guys, you don't need me. You've got all the plans. You've got it all laid out. You can pull this off without me. Uh, I'm going to stay back. I'll be praying for you. And he stayed home to drink lemonade and watch TV. And while his men were out fighting and risking their lives and carrying out the plans that he had helped make, he's a bit bored. He's restless, wondering what the guys are doing, haven't heard news for a few days. I wonder what's happening on the battlefield. And he's just walking back and forth on the rooftop. He looks, he lusts, and he sins. 
He's got to cover that, you understand. Wouldn't be good for that to get out. He sends word to Joab, the general, and says, send Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, send her home. And Uriah comes home and meets with David, the first thing. David finds out all the news of the battle and the war and what's taking place and how they're doing and the victories they're winning and, and gets all of that information. And then says, Uriah, go home to your wife, spend a week, take it easy uh, before you go back. And Uriah says, I can't do that. And David says, well, I insist. He says, well, I can't do that. While my men are out, the men that I lead and my fellow soldiers are out risking their lives and dying, you want me to go home, sleep in my bed, enjoy my family? No, I can't do that. I refuse to do that. And Uriah slept on the on David's porch with the servants rather than go home to his wife. Well, that foiled all of David's plans. And can you believe this? David wrote a note to Joab the general, gave it to Uriah. And the note said, when Uriah gets back, send him to the hottest front line spot of the battle and have your men back off so he'll die a hero. Joab carried his, only, his own death note to Joab. And so it was done. Uriah died, everybody applauded. Wow, what a hero. But David knew. What do you do with that kind of thing in your life? Well, that's easy. You bury it. You cover it. You hide it. You forget about it. You go over the top of it. The proper time he married Bathsheba, hey, everything's good. Don't worry about it. He goes right on, like, goes right on to church, raises his hand during the praise songs. Hey, there's no, everything's good. And it's buried, and he feels no pain, no guilt. But there's this preacher. Seems to be one in every crowd, you know. He came one day, banged on the king's door. King said, oh, come in, preacher. Preacher said, I got a story I want to tell you. Oh, I love your jokes. Is this a new one? Love your jokes. Yeah. And Nathan the prophet said, there was this rich guy. Had all these sheep. Lots of sheep. Pedigree. Registered. Shown at the fair. Prize winning. Valuable. Lots of them. Sheep. Registered. Had this neighbor. Poor. Had one little ewe lamb. <laughs> Can you believe it? The rich guy had a friend that came to visit him. He's going to spend a couple days. Wanted to, wanted to have a banquet for him. So he planned, the rich guy planned this big meal. And he needed a lamb to feed to his guest. And you know what he did? He went down to his poor neighbor. Took his one little lamb. Slaughtered it and fed it to his guest. David was on his feet. David just rose up in anger. David said, has that happened in my kingdom? Who is that rich man? Who did that? I will. And then came the bony finger of the preacher. <laughs> you are the man. And suddenly all that had been hidden and all that had been buried was just exposed. And David 
crumbled. And out of that moment came Psalms 51. Listen to this thing. Psalms 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitudes of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from all my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inner parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. O oh God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O oh God the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart these oh God you will not despise a defining moment and a response It was the right response. It's the ABC of the gospel. Starting the new year. Consider it. The ABC of the gospel. Abandonment. There isn't any question in the passage. And man, this moves me. There isn't any question in the passage. There is an absolute, down to it, abandonment of David to the character of God. D did you notice at the beginning of his plea, in, very, in the very first verse, verse 1, have mercy! On me, O oh God, according to your loving kindness. Have, have mercy. The absolute down to it belief in the character of God and who he is and how he's going to treat me. See, if you haven't figured that one out, you will never abandon to God. See, that's one of the huge, huge tricks of the devil himself. It's to confuse us in our thought process until we view God in some ways that he's not. 
And if he can get you confused about how God is and how God responds and how God thinks and what his character and nature is, then you will never abandon yourself to it because you can't trust him. You aren't sure how he's going to respond. But when you come back to the heart of God and you know the heart of God like David did, when you come back to the heart of God and you know the heart of God like I know the heart of God, then you have an absolute confidence that I can without question without hesitation without any reservations whatsoever I can just leap into the very arms of the character of God and there is nothing there but mercy and forgiveness and grace and love but see you can't abandon yourself to him unless you're absolutely convinced of that And I want to convince you of that. I don't know how to convince you of that. And and I've told you before, I get these phone calls just consistently where people say to me, God's mad at me. No, he's not. He doesn't get mad at you. Why? It's not his character. Well, God is writing me off. No, he's not. Why? He's not that way. God is wiping his hands of me. No, he isn't. No, he isn't. Why? Because he doesn't think like that. Well, God has cut me out. No, he hasn't. Why? Because God is constantly working on how to cut you in. And he's not into cutting you out. He's into cutting you in. Now, if you think I'm proposing to you a God who's a gigantic grandfather of the sky and just, oh, what a, my grandboy can't do anything wrong, you're dead wrong. If you think I'm presenting to you a Santa Claus of the sky who's just passing out lollipops at Christmas time, you're dead wrong. That's not what I'm talking about. Well, doesn't God have judgment? Yes. Doesn't God get upset? Absolutely. Doesn't God have wrath and anger? Yes. It's all over the scriptures. It's, there's no question about it. Well, can you give me an example of the wrath and anger of God? Well, absolutely, brother. I can give you a good example. It's the cross. No, 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 no. That's the love of God. Yeah, it is. No, it's the anger and wrath of God. Well, it's his judgment all over the place. Well, is it his wrath? Is it his love? Is it his judgment? Is it his mercy? What is this cross anyhow? It's the character of God who says, I hate sin. I cannot stand it in your life. And why can't I stand it in your life? Because I see what it's doing to you. And I, I see the destruction. And I see where it's taking you. And I cannot stand it. And I hate it so much. I'm going to judge that sin with everything I've got. Oh. And he took the entire judgment of sin upon himself. So mercy and grace could come to me. And if you ever really see that, you will just run and leap into the arms of the character of God saying, Oh, have mercy on me because that's what he'll do. That's who he is. That's his very character. See, that's what's going on in the Christmas genealogy. What's Tamar doing in this? It's this character of God. Well, what's this harlot Rahab doing in the... It's the character of God to reach out and... See, that's... What's this Ruth, the Moabite, the worst enemy Israel has? What's she doing in the genealogy of the Savior? That's his character. What's this Stephen Manley doing in the sonship of Jesus? Oh, that's his character. It's the character of God. That's who he is. Abandonment. 
And I'm proposing to you the only possibility you've got of total absolute abandonment. I'm talking just running and leaping into the arms of his character. Is that you are gripped with the overwhelming fact of who he is. And folks, it burdens me that we stand at the edge of the pool and dip our toe in. We don't leap. We are such cons, aren't we? Manipulate him. Bargain with him. Okay, God, if you'll do this, I'll do this. We, we are such control freaks. We want to control our own redemption. We are so partial in our abandonment. And I want to challenge you this new year. Would you just, would you just recklessly, would you just lavishly, would you just wastefully just take your life and just, just leap without reservation and abandon yourself to all that he is and let everything rest there. But I want this. No, don't worry about that. See, David isn't crying out, well, Lord, what about my kids that came out of this, my kids that have come out of this relationship? He's not, he's not dealing with his family. He's not dealing with the, with the results. He's not, he's, oh, God. I'm leaping into your arms. Have mercy. Because that's who you are. The ABCs of the gospel. Abandonment. But let me suggest to you, abandonment has, what would you call it? A nature? There is a characteristic there is a there is a texture to abandonment this kind of abandonment it's always there wherever you find this kind of abandonment you will find this texture there's an aroma to this abandonment wherever it takes place you can just smell it, it just fills the atmosphere it's always there there is no abandonment that jumps into the arms of God that this, this isn't present. And it's, it's the ABCs. It's brokenness. It's interesting to me that three times in the passage, he brings this word up. Now, it's in my translation that way. For instance, if you go down to verse 8, he says... Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. God, you've broken my bones. Now, you understand that's an Old Testament concept. It's not a bad concept. But put it in perspective. God, you bro you you've been breaking my bones, man. See, the Old Testament concept is God is sovereign. Absolute. It's a New Testament concept too. God is sovereign. Hey, I buy that. Which means he's in charge of everything. That's exactly right. Which means if anything happens, he's responsible for it. And while he may not cause everything, he allows everything. Therefore, he's to blame. Because he could have stopped it. Did you follow that? You see that all over the Old Testament. Come on, this will help you if you get a hold of this. See, the view was God is sovereign. Absolutely. So since God is sovereign and nothing happens without his approval, then everything that takes place is because of him. 
And while he may not directly cause it himself, he certainly allowed it to happen. And if he allowed it to happen, he's responsible for it. So you, I've been breaking my bones. The truth of the matter is, God wasn't breaking his bones at all. Sin was. You walked on a rooftop, buddy. You should have been out with the guys at war. And you played the softy, and you walked on the rooftop, you looked, you lusted, and then you murdered. And what did that do to you that literally broke your bones? Was God responsible for that? He's in charge of everything. He's in charge of everything. And he certainly allowed it. So, yeah, God, you broke my bones. But the truth is, David took a gun and shot himself in the foot and said, God, you just shot me in the foot. (laughs) Well, God could have stopped it, I know. But that's a part of his character. So, you do, you see what God is doing in David's life. He's saying, David, hey, Just run along. Hey, do your thing, David. But it's going to get you, boy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hang around. I'm going to hang around. And when it's about to ruin you, I'm going to have some preacher stick his finger in your face. And you're just, you'll collapse. And I'm going to break you, boy. And your sin is going to take you to the cross. Which is a place of brokenness. And it's only when you are broken, people. It's only when you are broken. It's only, and well, I don't know what that means to you. But it's only when you are broken that you say, Oh, God, I've got no place to go. I've got nothing I can do. I can't pull this off. I'm going to run with everything I've got and leap into your arms of your character and trust you in abandonment. And in every bit of a real abandonment, there is this brokenness. And if you say, well... I'm not, I'm not there yet. We're just hanging around waiting. Because it'll get you. Sin will gnaw you away until there's nothing left. And it's interesting. He brings this same thing up in verse 17. Look at it. Go to verse 16. You do not desire sacrifice or else I would give them. So God, if your standard was sacrifice, say, hey, I'll pull them off. Yeah, I'll go down to the temple, off that lamp. Yeah, burn that thing. Hey, I'll do that. I don't, I don't mind that. You don't delight in burnt offerings. What, what is he saying? Well, if, the, if, 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 if it was, well, I'll go to church more. Well, I, I'll, okay, I'll read my Bible. Okay, I'll pray more. Okay, I'll give more money to the church. Okay, see, if, if that was the deal, I, I, I'd pull that off. And I can do that without brokenness. I can strut in my pride and pull that one off. I can, I can look at, see, this is why Christianity's not doing, it's being, because you got to be broken. You can't do brokenness. See, you can do everything else, but you can't do brokenness. And yet brokenness is the heart of abandonment. And he says, you don't delight in burnt offerings. He says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite Now, you've heard this before. The whole premise of the Sermon on the Mount is what? You're congratulated for what? You're poor in spirit. 
What's poor in spirit all about? Brokenness. I'm helpless. I'm not, well, I need help now and then. I, no, that's not what I am. I am helpless. I'm telling you, I am absolutely, life has surrounded me and smashed me. And I am absolutely, totally helpless. And I mourn over that. Second beatitude. I mourn over that. Meaning what? I embrace that like I embrace, like, like grief embraces me. And I just, I, brokenness just overwhelms me. And I live in a broken state. And that's what gives me the ability to run and leap into the character, the arms of the character of God. And folks, see, if Christianity is another con, if Christianity is, well, okay, God, I'll, I'll confess if you'll do that. See, if there's an angle to this, <laughs> this is no angle. This is God. If you never bless me, God, if you just... If my circumstances get worse instead of better, this is God, whatever happens in my life. This is, oh God, have mercy on me. Because I'm going to abandon myself in brokenness to you. Listen to his cry. I acknowledge, this is verse 3, I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is always before me. <laughs> well, David, that wasn't true a few months ago. See, you buried the whole thing, boy. You just... Pfft. You committed murder and didn't blink an eye, son. But now, I'm broken. And it's interesting. And there's a whole another sermon on this, but in verse 4, against you and you only. See, he didn't say, oh, I've sinned against Bathsheba. I, I sinned against the child that didn't make it. I sinned against my kids. I, no. It's, oh God. I stabbed you. And isn't it interesting? Every violation of sin is a direct slap in the face of God. And the brokenness comes because I finally realize I'm the one that nailed him. And in that brokenness, not, well, yeah, I felt that way 20 years ago. I'm talking, I, David says, I, I'm, my sin is always, be, I live in a state of brokenness. That's what enables me to abandon myself. Would you embrace brokenness? today the ABC's of the gospel abandonment brokenness consecration I really want to call it creation because it's verse 10 he says create in me a clean heart now there's two words in the Hebrew language for create or that are used in that kind of scene. One is the word used here, create. The other is more of a fashion kind of thing, meaning shape, meaning reach into my life and, and reshape me, meaning, hey, take my life and, and like it is, but, you know, carve some of the rough edges off, put some, put some, add some things to it, put a little putty here and just shape me out and just, but see, that's not what this is. This is create, which is 
has the idea of initiating something new. This is, God, would you create a whole new heart and stick it in me? Would you risk being a different person? Oh man, I got this temptation, I got this temptation, and I got this struggle, and I got this trial, and I got, and I got, and I got, and I got. Would you risk an abandonment that literally runs and leaps into the arms of God in a character in the arms of his character and literally absolutely abandon, no strings attached, no, no, no reservations, no conditions, just totally, absolutely his. And in that, in that state of brokenness, resting in his arms, he would create a whole new heart. You could be a new person. (laughs) This is not a paint job. This is not makeup, ladies. This is a new face. This is not covering up the wrinkles. That's Christianity. Whoa. That's the message we've got for every man on the street. And it isn't the message we just yell. It's the message we are. Because that's us, isn't it? We've abandoned ourselves. We just, we were broken. We just, we had nowhere to go. And we just ran with all our might into his arms of his character, his nature, who he is. And he just took his whole nature and shaped it so it fit in us. That's why Tamar's in the genealogy. That's why in a harlot, Rahab, what's she doing? Because that happened to her. That's why Ruth, the Moabite, what? Worst enemy of Israel. That's why she's... And that's why this person called she, doesn't even mention her name, just her. Jesus, wow. Don't solve my problem. Don't change my circumstances. Jesus, break me, smash me, break my bones. And I know you don't do that kind of thing. But you're sovereign and you're standing back and you're just, sin is just, my self-sufficiency is just wearing itself out. And I walk the floors in worry and I'm filled with anxiety and I'm just tearing my life up, breaking my own bones. And all the time you're waiting in the wing, hiding in the shadows, patiently, waiting for me to come to brokenness. where I would run in abandonment into your arms and you could create a brand new heart in me.
Could this be a defining moment for our lives? Have you allowed us to live to the first day of 2017? And did you cause it to be on Sunday? And brought us to church, some of us, when we didn't even want to. We didn't want to come. But here we are. Because there's a defining moment. And how we respond. Will affect our destiny. Heads are bowed. I invite you. To run into abandonment. No reservation, no hesitation. No conditions, no safety net. Leap into his arms. It's where your life is found. I invite you to a stress-free, worry-free, care-for-nothing 2017. Because you have abandoned yourself and are not in charge and you are broken in helplessness with no way to control or fix but you know him and he is adequate for 2017 You don't have to do this. You can have 2017 like you had 2016. You can fret, you can worry, you can complain. But this could be a defining moment. Oh, want to pray with me? Our altar is open for response.